Welcome to the Landmark Theaters Q&A podcast. In this podcast, you will hear a discussion with Jeremiah Tower and director Lydia Tenaglia from the film Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent. Moderated by KCRW's Evan Kleinman. Recorded at the Landmark in West Los Angeles. Fantastic. I, I was doing some reading, and, um, and also I had watched some of the... the um, the food stuff that you did with um, Tony that were sort of in overtly inspired by different sort of literary genres or other movies. And I'm wondering if there was any of that that was brought to bear on the recreations. I mean, you know, when you do a documentary, you always go into like recreations with a kind of sense of wincing because <laughs> they can either be really great or not, um, you know, uh, and uh, people have asked a lot about the recreations. I mean, I think when we first started out with the film, what we knew we had as the main elements were the interviews and uh, some very, it was a very robust um, kind of still photography archive. Um, but it, I felt like it was important and very, you know, um, really imperative for the film to kind of give a sense of those early uh, sense memories, those sort of formative years of Jeremiah's youth, traveling around the world, um, those experiences, and really sort of recreations were, were the only material we, we, we could uh, think of to, to do that, not having anything else to, to work with. So I think from very early on, we, we felt recreations were going to be important, and we wanted to figure out how to do them in a way that, that, that were evocative of, of memory. When you when you remember your youth, you remember that in a, a sort of very fuzzy and, and kind of nuanced way. And, and I think that was this, the, the idea going into those. But how about the, the little boy with his finger stuck in the croque and bouche? Yeah. And he's pulling the caramel. And, he, you know, and his fingers are stuck. And he finally gets one you know, filled with caramel cream, sticks it in his mouth, and then looks up at the camera. For me, that told the whole story. <laughs> I mean, they were really, uh, when they f were first started, I, w I found myself like being taken aback. But I, I was charmed and engaged. And um, I think it's really difficult to get that kind of dreamlike um, sense without something being cheesy. And I think it was so well done. Um, Jeremiah, one of the things I have to ask you is this, this life of yours that's such a a play between an almost aristocratic remove and the act of feeding people and engendering this kind of very body, sensual closeness is really interesting. <laughs> I don't know that I have a particular question, but if you would like to comment. Well, that aristocratic remove was the English upbringing when I was eating gruel and margarine and horrible white bread and marmalade, you know, so um, that, you know, it, but I had known first class, so then I just spent the rest of that. I mean, English boarding school and the English way of life when you're boarding school is so horrible. I mean, you know, only cold water, one bath a week. Um, each sheet stayed on the bed for two weeks. You know, for teenage boys, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And when you, <laughs> when you did bathe, you know, you were supposed to bathe from your wrist to your fingertips and from the top of your socks to the, you know, the bottom of your shorts. Um, and then, of course, you know, once a w anyway, you get the picture. So uh, I just live for someone to pour me that cup of consomme. <laughs> oh, so talking of consomme, what a perfect segue. So I, I was reading, and I read that in college you made a cannabis consomme. Oh, yes, marijuana consomme, absolutely wonderful. Because, you know, <laughs> now, of course, you just buy the, if one did buy it, one, <laughs> one buys the flowers, I mean, the tips. So, but in those days, you know, you got a, an ounce bag or two ounce bag, and it was just this crap, you know. Um, so you would sort of have to put it, shove it through a sieve and then smoke that. And you'd have 80% of it was the stems and everything. So, of course, you had to make that into a consomme or butter. So, I mean, uh, yes, I, I mean. I think this is an excellent business opportunity for you now. <laughs> 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 I, 
Well, it's all in the timing because, you know, when do you serve that consomme? Because you want it to hit you just before dessert is served. Um, ju just before um, we, we came into the theater, you mentioned to me that you had been shooting at Tavern on the Green for months and th that you actually had enough footage that that could have been a whole separate film. Was there anything else in, in the movie that wasn't the Tavern on the Green that you, that you were so sad that you had to leave out? Yeah, I mean, there was a cut of the film that was almost three hours long at one point, and I was like, this is it, it's done. And then, of course, you know, uh, CNN, who was our benefactors on this, said, you know, no, 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 no one's going to sit through a three-hour film. But there were, there were some really, really beautiful recreations that I wish uh, we had had time to keep oh, in. Oh, there needs to be a director's cut. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, yeah. I think one... And the th outtakes, that, you know... <laughs> Yeah. Isn't that what they call them? Yes. You know, all the stuff yeah. on the floor? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one in particular I thought was, th actually there are two in particular. One was um, an experience he had. His uh, mother's sister was married to a very sophisticated Russian guy. Um, who his Russian uncle, as Jeremiah called him, and he sort of uh, inculcated him in the ways of sort of Russian bellini and caviar and vodka, and it was a beautiful, beautiful recreation scene that we had done with the butter sort of dripping down uh, the wrist, and that got cut out, if you want to talk about that. Well, but the point was about blini, because the Russians say if the butter wasn't running down, first you take a blini, and then you pour melted butter over it, then you put sour cream in the center, and then you pile it with caviar or smoked salmon or smoked sturgeon or whatever. But when you pick it up, if the butter doesn't run down inside your sleeve, uh, you have to add more butter. I was also going to ask you from the white Russian side of, of, uh -huh. of your is was there um, a fascination with um, czarist style food or pre you know pre Soviet Union Russian service and that level of just exuberant tableware? And oh yes, I mean when I was sixteen, my mm -hmm. Russian uncle invited me down to Washington and said, "Okay, here's your test of manhood." And I'm thinking, oh my God, we're going to go visit a whorehouse or something, you know. <laughs> but actually, it was just lunch. Uh, <laughs> but you started with, you know, zakuski, and you had, well, the Russian tradition at Easter was that you had, you know, four or five types of, of let's say, four types of vodka, and then the host would have had his own special one, which was Rabinivka or the mountain ashberry after the first frost, or, you know, some wild mushroom, something like that. So then you had to have those as well. And and then caviar and s smoked fish and God knows what, uh, mushrooms, and then and then the dinner started. Then the lunch started. Um, if you weren't already you know completely loaded by that time, um, and then you would have uh, guinea fowl cooked in hundred-year-old Madeira with kasha and wild rice. I mean, it goes on and on and on and sour cream and butter and more sour cream and more butter, and then uh, ice cream and then. 16 ounce scotches and soda. I mean, it was just incredible. So I survived. <laughs> so he said, okay, now that you've survived, you have to bring down your classmates. Michael Palmer was in the film. We nearly, he nearly died at his uh, initiation. But there was, I was entranced because the old Russians, um, on their best side, you know, were amazing. I mean, I would sit there and have lunch, and uh, Sharimetev, would uh, tell stories of his y childhood friend Yusupov who killed Rasputin. But my favorite, my absolute favorite, was the sort of one of the hundred crown princes of Poland who uh, at one of the lunches, was one of the guests said, you know, I've got a headache. Have you got an aspirin? He just like that said, take the France, it sails. Take the France instead, it sails at six. I mean, you know, for a 16-year-old kid, I was wildly impressed. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about Lucius Beebe. Beebe? Beebe. Lucius Beebe. Is it Beebe? Mm. Talk to me a bit about him. Well, that's where the slightly embarrassing title, Last of Magnificent, comes from, um, as you saw in the film. Um, that was from the article in Gourmet by James Villas about Lucius Beebe, his hero and mine. Um, I was, I was 
never thrown out of Harvard, though I was asked possibly to leave a couple of times. But uh, I never showed up drunk, you know, to classes at first thing in the morning. But by 11 o'clock, sometimes I would go and have a martini. Because I never had a top hat, and I never had a cane, but I certainly admired the man who said that, you know, a day out on the town where you have a hot bird and a cold bottle, which is a roast chicken and a butter maraché. Okay. Do you think such a thing exists now? What would that be? Well, he had a private railroad. You know, I mean, not railroad. No, he had a private uh, ro train car. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. And, you know, when he would want to go to have dinner someplace, he'd get in his, train uh, his private car and hook it to a train and go off. Um, is anyone doing that today? No, I think they're... Not the you know, same it, as it, flying I think a jet. Yeah, it's probably much more like... Um, Facebook going out to have a hamburger. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, a billion but, but dollars you know, is not what it used to be. And you know, as Anthony Bourdain said at the end of the film, he's sort of the, one of the last people who really sort of understood that connection between the old world and the new, and all the romanticism of that embodied. And I think that that's what certainly makes him a you know amazing central um, character. Okay. Like the simplicity, for instance, of that great New York restaurant a long time called Le Pavillon with Henri Soule. And that menu was outside the, uh, above the entrance to the restaurant at Stars for years. And it was just like, you know, roast chicken, sold in cream sauce, that kind of thing. So, but it was the most glorious, most sought after reservation in all the United States for decades. And yet it was just, it looked so simple, was so simple. Um, and he was a great guy because I admired him tremendously because every morning, He'd bring the caviar supplier, would come in and open five tins of caviar. He would taste them all, set, accept one, and send the others back. And I just thought, boy, that one of these days I'll get to do that. <laughs> um, did you, I know today was a very busy day for you. You started out in New York. Um, and this is the third of these today. Um, did you happen to read Frank Bruni's essay in the New York Times about James Beard and the um, and his sexuality and how it was never revealed even in his obituary. Well, no, I didn't. When oh, when you it, it I, I think it, it came out today or yesterday. Well, and it's I'm one. I'm just wondering if if he had been out to the public, how different would it have been for you? Yeah, if anybody had been out, it would have been different for me. <laughs> 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 I mean, there were plenty of queens, you know, in gay bars around the place, but that w was not my scene. I didn't like that at all. Um, if Jim had been out, yes, I think I would have probably had the... More but, you know, I, d I don't think anyone's sexuality is political. So I never denied it. I never made a point of it. And I certainly never denied it. Because I just think, you know, that's the least interesting thing about you, unless you know somebody's interested in you, then that's interesting. But apart from that, you know, I mean, it's the uh, hot bird and the cold bottles much more interesting. Um, the the voiceovers that you have th that are in the movie, part of the the abyss of gray mediocrity, and then later on that that beautiful scene where it starts to snow towards the end of the film, was that was that. Um, sound that had been taken from scenes that were shot, or did you go back? That those, uh, you know, very early on in the process, he m maybe unwittingly handed me all of his diaries from his youth. Very unwittingly. That he, ke <laughs> he kept from um, his late teens into his late 20s, early 30s, uh, certainly up and through Chez Panisse. Um, and I... I, incredible. I, yeah, it was incredible, and then there, there was they were quite lengthy, um, and then you know at one point I, I read through all of them and I was highlighting and cutting passages and um, sort of putting them on our big uh, editorial board and you know th it just came a moment when the film started to coalesce that I realized those um, those words his very words you know had incredible weight and punctuation for so many moments in the film and so. The idea came out to um, to use that as a, a kind of narrative element. 
And those are, those are his voice words. And the voice. Yeah. The I'm not a human being came from when I was 19 and full of mescaline. You know? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but they s still seem to make sense, you know, looking at the movie. They're beautiful. Yeah. It certainly stunned the Tribeca Film Festival premiere. There wasn't, there wasn't a sound for about 10 minutes, and I said to Lydia, we, I think we have to run for it. They, they hate the movie. <laughs> yeah, but that, that mediocrity line, that was from a, a diary that he wrote, uh, you know, when he was at Harvard. So, um, but they were, you know, pulling it. Yeah, so Very those, were, those were his words, yeah. So, Los Angeles has become more of a food scene than it was when you were doing your thing. And I'm just curious, if you were a chef in LA today, how would you how would you do your thing with the LA sort of you know mix of cultures and everything? Well, I mean, I would, of course, you know, the uh, Mexican food truck and street food scene. I have every morning in, in Merida, so I wouldn't try and imitate that. But look back on it, you know, that actually Los Angeles in the 70s, late 70s set the California style. I mean, you look at West Beach Cafe, which was the first. I went in there and I was absolutely stunned and I went, oh my God, this is the future. And then I went to see Michaels and Trumps, um, you know, the waiters and chinos and pink shirts instead of uh, vicious French maitre d's and black tie. I mean, it was a huge change. I mean, the food revolution may have started in, in Northern California, but the style, the look of, of the restaurants that changed America and Sydney and London started here. And also what was on the plate, if you look at what he was serving, that Mexican breakfast that he was serving at West Beach Cafe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, nobody was... It, you would never have seen it in a, in a restaurant of that type then. I, th I think that was the, I mean, if I lit one match, the West Beach Cafe lit the other. <laughs> Hi, I had two questions. I want to know if you had any formal training or was it everything you learned was when you were a young boy and what were you doing in the years after you left Shea, Venice, and before Stars? Uh, no formal training in terms of a culinary school. Certainly, the f you saw that my formal training, that's the first half of the film. Um, and then after I left Chez Panisse, I started to look for money to open uh, st my next restaurant, which I wanted to be in San Francisco. <coughs> so I redid the Balboa Cafe uh, because I, that guy could guarantee the, the bank loan and then did the Santa Fe Bar and Grill which uh, sort of revived the whole American bar and grill, salsas and grilling and mesquite and all that sort of thing. Um, and sort of launched Mark Miller. Yeah, well, it was his, and then it failed, and I took it over. Yeah, and then, but then he went off to do Coyote Cafe, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. As a young to chef. The, as a young chef, to be the best I could be, where would I work? Um, First I would of all, you have to be willing to work for free. Well, you're obviously going to, if you're asking that question, you're going to be good and someone's going to pay you well. Uh, I would go to, in London, I would go to the Ledbury. He's a great chef and he loves to uh, shoot woodcock for me, so I'm, you know, I love that. Um, here, I would go anywhere that you really admire. Let me tell you a story. My lawyer now in New York, very successful lawyer, he was 16 or 17, he would came into Stars and he had lunch. And he said hello to the kitchen, the open kitchen. Next day, he came back and had lunch and said hello to the kitchen when he was leaving. And th by that time, I, was, I noticed him. Um, third day, he came in lunch and came over and said, you know, thank you very much. And I said, who the hell are you and what are you doing here? He said, I'm going to work here. I said, you are? He said, yes, tomorrow I'm coming in and you're going to give me a job. And I said, well, okay. Screw you, you little impotent, you know. <laughs> I, well, I can't repeat what I said to him. But anyway, I said, okay, but you can start working today if you want to. See that? So I went down and I got 10 boxes of tomatoes this tall and said, you're going to make, you know, going to peel those and chop them up and make uh, concasse. And he did it and never complained. I mean, his, I think his fingers were bleeding by the end of it. I said, right, you've got a job. You're in. Because he had the right attitude, no training, but he had the right attitude. So if somebody comes to me as a, and said, I'm a, you know, I want to be your sous chef and I'm, so, I'm hot shit, you know, 
because I've done this, this, and this. If I feel I don't have the right attitude, I'm not going to hire them. If I feel somebody has the right work ethic and attitude, then we can train each other together. So go where you most respect and say, you're hiring me. That's how I got my first restaurant job. I walked into a, I had been catering for years. I'd never worked in a restaurant. I had been spending a lot of time in Italy. I knew the food. I went to a restaurant I loved here. And I said to her, you know, I know how to cook this food better than anybody you have cooking for you. I'll work for you for two weeks for free. And then she hired me. And then the other people left. <laughs> <laughs> One night at Chez Panisse, I mean, uh, Willie, the, the bearded beatnik, um, had, you know, had overdosed on coke or something. I don't know. Anyway, he couldn't cook anymore. So I looked at the dishwasher who was illegal. He was 16 years old and jo the great Joshua Kahn. Anyway, he, I said, Joshua, come over here. I don't know who's going to wash dishes. We were all going to do it, I guess. J Joshua, come here. This is how you do it. See, and I cook this sautéed thing, whatever. And I said, now you do it. And uh, it was about 85%. I said, OK, no, do it this way again. Try it again. It was a 99%. I said, right. You're, you're my line cook now. Aww. Yeah. Yeah, it's people forget how manual a task it is. And you either have it in you as motion with palate or, or you don't. Right. Um, Sort of playing off the, the question about the LA scene, but not so much about LA. I mean, these days, at the MAD conference that where you spoke, you talked about ingredients as being foundational to everything. And now I think any good chef, especially in this city when we have so much easy access, farm to table is just a given. That's not even the name of a kind of restaurant anymore. It's just a given. So. When you see the kind of sort of schizophrenia on plates and menus right now, if, if you were to come in and do a restaurant that sort of takes as its sort of launching pad the next layer over what's going on now, what would that look like? Or would you have to just strip everything away? Well, I think Liddy should uh, answer why we go to Gram Gramercy Tavern in New York. Then I'll answer. Wh why do we go to Gramercy Tavern? I, 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 you know, I just the, the whole the whole experience from the moment you walk through the door to the time you leave is just perfect and seamless and in unencumbered, but uh, beautiful word. Um, but just uh, it's it's not overly produced but just perfect. It's like h taking the ingredients that are really great and making them something um, that you just want to look at and, and you want to eat. And it's unencumbered, I think, is the word. That unencumbered is My mother would say not potchkeet. Yeah, not not potchkeet. Yeah. And no chef, no presence as a chef going, look, me, 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 me. You know, Much more, look what this beautiful turbo I found. You know, And look at the fresh morals I just found. Um, you know, the restaurants in Barcelona, for instance, that have a beautiful fish, a hake, which they adore. And, you know, it was caught that morning. And then it has some mussel or clam broth over it that's been mixed with a little bit of essence from shrimp shells or lobster shells. Uh, then the little dots of perfect olive oil, done. And you're just in awe of how unencumbered and beautiful and delicious that is. A great chef knows how to buy the ingredients, find them, buy them, store them, because if they're not stored properly, it doesn't matter how good they are, and then cooks them as simply as possible. And there shouldn't be any noise of the chef saying, my name is, and I come from, and my mother's name is, my grandfather's name is, no. Unencumbered. First of all, thank you to all three of you for the work that you do. Uh, Mr. Tower, I wonder in this time of you know farm to table and all of this abundance, we also have this. Uh, how do you feel about veganism and vegetarianism and pescatarian menus and, and all of those things that we seem to restrict uh, ourselves? Will they please stay out of my restaurants? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> you know, it's just become so... I genuinely applaud and appreciate if somebody is that. But if you're trying to do a one-upmanship on the guests around you and the other people at the table, then I have no patience for it, you know. I mean, I, if I were a true vegan, I think I would find it very difficult to go to whatever dinner party at a, any restaurant that I was invited to. Um, Unless you lived in Los Angeles. <laughs> Oh, well, That's you're also spoiled, you know, you yeah. get everything you want here. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, the unsinkable Molly Brown, what was her name, the actress? Anyway, she would come to Stars with a little box. She had, a, you know, whatever food situation she found herself in. She would come with this box. Tony Ann Gotti, who you saw in the film, he knew her. Um, who is it? Carol Debbie Channing. Carol Debbie Channing. Debbie Brown or Carol Channing? Carol Channing. Channing. And uh, she made no fuss. She would leave her food at the maitre d's desk because she didn't want any waiter or cook touching it. And then when the right moment came, I would go over with a plate, put the food from the out of the box onto the plate and take it over to her. Case closed. No announcement to the table. Nobody, you know, I mean... No unencumbered. Unencumbered. No personal statement of me, me, me to interrupt the other people at the table. So if you can have all those things you want, whatever it is, without interrupting the, the table and the other people, then hallelujah. Oh, are you sifting through offers now? Well, Lydia, Lydia and I are going to do, uh, you know, Last Magnificent too. <laughs> I mean, we're in Los Angeles. What else can you do? <laughs> now, I'm writing a book that's about to it'll come out in a few months. Uh, called Flavors of Taste, and I'm going to get my public speaking career going. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And you, Lydia? i got to get back to my day job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I have a company in New York called Zero Point Zero, and we have a lot going on there, yes. so um, um, this was a really important uh, creative um, endeavor for me, I, I like you know. I started out in the field and editing and very hands-on. And as a company grows, you you start to become more of a manager of other people's creativity. And I had been feeling for a while that I wanted to jump back in and contribute to Zero Point Zero in a creative way. And so this project is that for me. Um, and I, I there's other projects I I want to do, but um, we have a lot going on uh, there on the series front and what have you. So I gotta just. Uh, focus a little bit. <laughs> and we're, we're, we'll be glad that you do. Uh -huh. uh, did your parents ever enjoy the food? Yes, my parents, they never saw, first of all, I could, you know, when I first started cooking, I could never tell my family, my grandmother, she would have disowned me. I don't think my parents would have cared more or less, but, you know, they just had spent half a million dollars on my education to become an architect, so I never really told them either. Um... <laughs> You know, if I could have jumped immediately to fame, I guess, you know, it would have been okay. Um, but they, no, they died before the, the, the big success of Star, so they didn't see it. Um, Did you and Alice Waters ever work things out? Oh, Alice, oh, Alice yes. I actually, I emailed her last Monday to say, you know, I miss you. Everyone who's seeing the movie misses you. It, would you please come and moderate one of the, the show in Berkeley on Shattuck Avenue, just down the road from the restaurant? And her assistant said uh, she was unavailable, and it turns out she's gone to Europe. But yes, I sat with her at the 40th anniversary. The two of us sat in the middle of the dining room with all the other guests uh, and had dinner. And I, I would just add, for the record, that um, there was an interview set up with her. We had a whole block of interviews set up for uh, San Francisco, and she had agreed to do an interview. And then uh, two days before we left, she had a change of heart and didn't want to participate. So we had a couple of conversations after that, and you know, I respect her decision, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I, I really wanted her in the film, but she just didn't want to participate. I was curious how this project came about and if you were spending much time in Southern Quintana Roo anymore, and if the food's as good as the scuba diving there. 
Are you going to say how it came about? Yeah, yeah I mean, just really Then I'll quick, answer about scuba diving Really quickly, food. he wrote a memoir, California Dish. It's been actually very recently reprinted. Um, Start the Fire. Re-released as Start the Fire. There's this about, week, last week. Last week, and there's about 40% new material in that. I highly recommend the book. I'm not touting it, but that was the starting point for the film, the, his memoir. Um, you know, you read it and you realize this is a person who had an incredible impact on the culinary landscape of the United States, but there was the question mark, you know, where is he? <laughs> and what happened to him? And how come I don't know more? I mean, I've been working in food television for 17 years, and I hadn't heard of him. So um, that was kind of the starting point. So I, I really highly recommend you read the memoir. That was the whole kind of uh, uh, beginning point of the It's, the, it's the a script for the film, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the food in, in Quintana Roo? Um, with Yucatan, that's half of the uh, Yucate Yucatecan Peninsula is Quintana Roo, the other is uh, Yucatan. So the food is still wonderful. I go every morning to the market, to the local market, and have my soft tacos, either with you know hogfish or bocanete, with the radish and cilantro, lime juice, limes right off the tree, um, the salsa on top, I mean, f fantastic. That's when I'm not having venison or pig's foot or, you know, um, I alternate with those soft tacos, but the food is still wonderful. And the reefs in Cozumel are intact, beautiful, healthy, and great, because um, <coughs> to get the equivalent of that, I have to go to Papua New Guinea, and that's, you know, three days flight and $6,000 instead of 30 on the bus. Um, do, you, do you see, I mean, is Mexico now home forever? Or is there somewhere else that you would love to sort of plant yourself for an extended bit? Well, I mean, certainly I was looking at the beaches in Cambodia, but that was just, you know, because I like to look around the world every morning and think, where would I go? Uh, two weeks ago, I was in, Sevi in Seville in Spain and I have to say, that was pretty amazing. The food markets, like in Barcelona, um, just magnificent. Uh, so I might just end up there for a while. But I do, I, but you know, the diving, I can't, c the reason I've been there for so long in the, in the Yucatan is because I just couldn't think, where, I'm, where am I gonna go where I can go two hours and go diving, you know, for a month? that one line in the film was actually very telling about Jeremiah's personality where even though you know it was basically uh, uh, ba based on a, the, 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 the earthquake he said I should have gone down to the basement drunk the crew lit the match blown it up and that would have been great I mean I think he's he's definitely a rolling stone and he doesn't he doesn't seem to want to stay too long in, in one place and I think blowing things up and Leaving them sort of fiery in his wake is, is is part of his. No, that was just ZBZ. That wasn't it's a part bridge. Of his nature, <laughs> <laughs> definitely part of his nature. I I read recently, you know, somebody who said the measure of someone's life are the chances they take. I like that. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Thank you. You have been watching the Landmark Theatre's Q&A podcast. For further in-depth discussions with filmmakers, be sure to check out the other Q&As available on our channel from past films. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all our bonus content. Thanks for watching.